It's Easter. All through this year, we've been talking about a, a certain theme, and the theme that we had was the theme of overcoming different things. And so we worked on different things that we could overcome. We can overcome fear. We can overcome our past. We can overcome debt. We can overcome all kinds of different things. And our theme for today is overcoming death. As we've talked about overcoming, we've wanted to remember that we're not talking about a methodology or a self-help program. But in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus explains to us how we can overcome. He said to his disciples, I have told you all of these things so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. The greatest issue in the human condition is the issue of death. The one thing that everybody knows there is and yet very few people want to talk about is death. Today we will discover how we can overcome death. Not in our own might, not in our own strength, and not by our own process, but through what God has done through Jesus Christ, we're going to be able to see that. Now, my desire is that we would uh, follow along a passage today, and, and I, I thought about making you stand and read like all of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but then I thought that's a little bit too much. So we're not going to read the, all of chapter 15, but we're going to start off by reading the first nine verses of it. So please, everyone stand to your feet. And we're going to read together. Let's read together out loud. There's a, there's a big enough crowd of us today. We can read with enthusiasm. And let's proclaim the word of the Lord together as we read out loud. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church and the Christians who lived in Corinth. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was of most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. And last of all, as though he had been born at the wrong time, I saw him also. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I don't even be worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. Let's pray together. Father, we have a desire that you would speak to our hearts today through your Holy Spirit. We thank you that we can read your word and that all of us have an opportunity to read not only this part that we've read out loud, but other portions as we examine them. But ultimately, Lord, we're not here to acquire knowledge. We're here to have our lives impacted. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to have good understanding, to help us to understand the things that you want to say to us. But most importantly, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to be changed by the things that we learn, that we would put into action in our lives a different way of living, a way that overcomes death, a way that overcomes the things of this world, a way in which we are your true children. And I pray these things would become a reality. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Please take your seats again. You might have noticed the stage is a little bit different today. And if you were here on Good Friday, you know what this was set up for. This was set up to be a message that I gave on trees. And uh, this was the tree on the far end is the tree of life and, and, uh, and the Garden of Eden. And this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then we had a cross up here. And that was the tree on which Jesus was crucified. And then we had the fourth tree over here, which was, again, the tree of life in the end in the book of Revelation. And on Good Friday, I, I followed kind of a narrative. I, I wanted to unfold for you, as the Word of God unfolds for us, the passage or the narrative, the story of how God loved us so much that He desired to have a relationship with us and that we walked away from Him. And so He sent His Son to take on His Son all of the things, and we use the word blessings and we use the word curse. God desired to bless us, but because we walked away from Him, His blessing was withheld. And that, be, and that withholding of his blessing becomes a curse. And all of that withholding 
was placed upon Jesus, so we were set free. Now, that was a narrative story, a story that we can follow along. But this morning, I want to take a little bit more of a didactic approach. I think at heart, I'm not as much a storyteller as I am a teacher. And so I want to try and teach you from this passage today, and I want you to try and understand four important lessons that leave us to the conclusion and the implication of the conclusion that through and in Jesus Christ, we can overcome death. The first of all, we need to understand why Paul writes this passage. 1 Corinthians 15, it's it's, an amazing passage of Scripture. But why is he writing it? He's writing to the Christians who live in the city of Corinth. This is contained in the first letter to the people who live in Corinth. And they're having a problem, and the problem is kind of like this. Paul is responding to a problem that they have because people don't want to believe in a resurrection. The Christian message was all about the resurrection, not just of Jesus, but eternally or eventually everybody would be resurrected, and people don't want to believe in it. Now, the reason has a lot to do with Greek philosophy and what people believed in those days, but I know a lot of people don't understand it, but historically, most people 2,000 years ago didn't believe in a resurrection. They believed that when you died, that was all it was. Your ghosts may go off, your spirit may go off, but the idea of a resurrection didn't exist at all. And so when the Christians began to talk about Jesus being resurrected and all the Christians being resurrected, people looked at them funny. People thought, well, what a strange idea that is. So Paul writes this passage in order to convince them of the truth of what we believe. Now, the interesting thing for you and I is the world is completely different. In those days, nobody believed in a resurrection. In our day, everybody believes in a resurrection. And everybody believes it's just kind of out there. You know, I was surprised to see a statistic the other day that said, even a significant number of people who are atheists who say there is no God believe in a resurrection. And I'm thinking, where does that come from? If you don't believe in God, if you believe that the material world that we live in is all there is, how can you possibly believe in a resurrection? But many people do. And in the modern world that you and I live in, most people kind of think they're hoping that the resurrection is going to just happen for everybody no matter what. It's like if you kind of make it to the end of the day, then when the death comes in, you're going to go to heaven no matter what you ever did. And uh, that's certainly not what we believe. In fact, it's funny, 50 years ago, one of the techniques for for sharing your faith with somebody and and to share your faith with them about Jesus Christ and how they can have their sins forgiven would be to ask them this question. If you were to die tomorrow and you were to go to stand before Jesus and he would say, why should I let you into heaven? What do you think he would say? And that used to scare people. And people would say, whoa, I don't know. What what, what do I need to do? And then you could share about forgiveness and all this stuff, and you would share the thing. That doesn't work anymore. If you ask people today, if you die and stand before God, should he let you into heaven? Most people say, yeah, why not? You know, doesn't everybody sort of get into heaven? It's so confusing. That's what makes it really difficult for me as a pastor. Now, and please don't misunderstand me. Funerals are one of the favorite things that I do as a pastor. To do the funeral or to participate in the funeral of somebody who is a follower of Jesus Christ is a glorious thing. Now, of course, you mourn for those who have lost a loved one. Of course, I, I, I've, I've been to a number of different funerals. I understand that's important. And I've, I've mourned for people that have lost. But, but as, a, as a follower of Jesus, it's exciting to remember that they've gone to be with him and will all someday be with them as well. We mourn for them, but we thank God for the influence of their life. And even as a pastor, sometimes I'm asked to participate in a funeral of someone who wasn't a follower of Jesus. And I thank God that I have an opportunity to share with the family that God is the God of all comfort. And in any circumstance, they can turn to him and they can be comforted by him. But it's getting pretty confusing because people think that, you know, everybody should get into heaven no matter what. I heard a story. It's kind of a joke. You know, did you know that preachers have preacher jokes? Did you know that we have jokes we tell each other amongst ourselves? You know that? There's a famous kind of a preacher's joke about about these guys, these two men, they were twin brothers. They they looked the same, they acted the same, and they were equally horrible and wicked men. They they, they just did all kinds of terrible things. They cheated people, they robbed people, they broke the laws, they covered it up, they amassed a lot of wealth, they oppressed everybody all around them, and they were just generally bad, bad people. And then all of a sudden, one of the brothers died. And when he died, for the first time in his life, the the, the twin that didn't die was thinking, wow, uh, 
I should have some kind of religious service done for my brother, you know. It's got to, maybe it'll help him out, you know, somehow or something like that. So he started looking for a pastor who would do the service. He couldn't find one. Everybody knew the reputation of these twins, right? So nobody's willing to do this service. And so finally he found a preacher whose church was in kind of desperate straits and everything else. And he had a meeting with the preacher. He said, okay, look, this is the deal. If you do a funeral service, if you preach at my brother's funeral, I'll rebuild your church. I'll, you know, fix everything. I'll buy your, your church will have vehicles. I'll buy you a new suit. I'll do this, 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 this. And the preacher's kind of thinking, well, you know, maybe this is okay, you know. And then the guy said to him, but on one condition, I'll do all those things on one condition. You have to say that my brother was a saint. Oh, man, the preacher, that was hard, you know. So he thought about it for a while, and then he said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. So everything was prepared. The church was fixed up, painted, all the repairs made, all the other kind of thing, and it came time for the funeral. And there they were at the funeral, and the funeral went on and on and on, and finally the preacher had to get up to give the eulogy. And he was giving the eulogy. He was talking about all the things you do. He was born at such and such a time. He went to school at such and such a time, on and on and on and on. At the very conclusion of the, of the funeral eulogy, he said this. Very few of you here know this person, and those who didn't know him can be glad that you never met him. He ruined the lives of almost everyone he ever came in touch with. He was a thief. He was a cheater. He was a blasphemer. He was a womanizer. He was a bully, and he never felt a moment's sympathy for anyone he ever hurt. But compared to his twin brother, he was a saint. So, what is Paul saying in this passage of Scripture? First thing that we need to understand, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Right at the core of everything that we believe is a belief in eternity, a belief in eternity that is promised by a risen Savior who has been raised from the dead, has conquered death, has gone back to heaven, and is coming back someday to take you and I to be there. This is not a peripheral part of of Christianity. It is at the core of being a follower of Jesus to know that you will follow him into eternity. Paul goes on to quote here that there were hundreds of contemporary witnesses, including Peter and the 12, 500 people at one time, James, all of these things. There was no doubt about it. Everybody who was writing to, they didn't question it. It was the centrality of what they believed. And Paul goes on to point out that it had changed their lives, their belief in Jesus Christ. It wasn't just theory. It wasn't just historical fact. It was historical fact for them. For you and I, it's something that happened 2,000 years ago, and some skeptics today might question whether it happened. But these people had met Simon Peter. They had met the 12 disciples. They had met some of those 500 people. They were talking in their reality. They were talking in their generation. Paul wrote this particular book, and it's somewhere around 53 AD, within about 20 years of when Jesus died. There were lots of people who had seen him and heard him and had seen him after he was raised from the dead. It had changed their lives. You and I need to realize the fact that Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins and was raised from the dead is absolutely fundamental for who we are. Every now and then, people who are saying things and they want to say something nice to me, they'll say, oh, you know, Pastor Dave, I really respect Jesus. I really respect the teachings of Jesus. I really respect the philosophy of Jesus. I really respect the way Jesus loved all of, all of the people around him. And those things are true and good, and we, 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 we do respect those things, but we understand that Jesus didn't come to be a good teacher. Jesus didn't come to be a philosopher amongst other philosophers. He came to conquer sin and death. When he died on a cross, he conquered sin for us. And when he rose from the dead, he conquered death. He overcame death. And that's what this faith is all about. It changed their lives. It must change ours too. The second point that we want to understand is where we see the overcoming death idea come to more clarity. Paul said, but tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. It's important for us to know that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead in the same resurrection that starts and waits for us. There's not two resurrections. There's one resurrection. 
We are resurrected even as he was resurrected. He goes on to say in verse 19, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Think about that for a moment. Think about how that fits in with your everyday life. Do you live your life following Jesus as someone who is a risen Lord and Savior? Or do you only live your life following Jesus as someone who's merely a good teacher? Because if you're following a teacher, then you're making a mistake. Because that's not what this life is supposed to be all about. In verse 20, he says, In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. The other word that's used there is that word first fruits. Now, think about this for a moment. These, these are very impressive trees. By the way, I, I need to warn you, if you want to take pictures of the trees, and some people like to take pictures, like they're going down tomorrow. Tomorrow they're going to be chopped down and used for firewood. No, I'm just kidding. But these are really impressive trees. Don't, don't you agree? Yeah? These are very impressive trees. And, and they look good. They have this amazing bark and, they, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then they have all these wonderful leaves and different color leaves. And, and, and they even have fruit. I was disappointing because I was expecting durian. But they even have these fruit on it. But you know what? It's not real. In fact, if we left these trees up here for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, they would never produce any fruit. Because they can't. Because they're not real. The Bible tells us that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, he became the first fruit of all who will be resurrected. That means that you and I will be resurrected. Pastor Oyen re referenced that in his prayer. That means that each and every one of us will be resurrected because he was resurrected. You don't get fruit from a dead tree. But once fruit has been produced, it continues to produce the same kind of fruit. It's important for us to understand what it says in verse 19, that if our only hope in Christ is in this world, we are to be pitied more than anyone in the world. Because we need to understand that because Jesus Christ is alive, we will live for all eternity, and we must live our hope now in that resurrection. Or else the hope that we have is just like every other hope, and is just added in the world a competing philosophy in a world that is already choked with competing philosophies. We're not here to offer good moral guidelines. Yes, we believe in morality. We want people to live well, but we want people to be set free from their sins, to be forgiven, and be prepared to be in eternity forever. That's what we want for you. We want your life to change because of Jesus, not we want you to change because you try harder. It's in him that you have that new life. Number three, the life of this world must and will end. What I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment in the blinking of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. So many people in this world, they try so hard to find some way to extend their lives by just a little bit. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm all in favor of people being healthy. I'm all in favor of people eating right. I'm all in favor of people having healthy habits. I'm all in favor of being able to exercise and everything else. And if somehow, if you have the right genetic structure and the right training and the right diet and all the things, some of you may stretch your life out to 120 years, maybe 121. But that's it. See, what this passage of Scripture says is that flesh and blood cannot inherit eternal life. You can train and you can train and you can train, and maybe someday you can jump as high as a, an athlete in the NBA. Or maybe someday you can run as fast as somebody in the Olympics, but you can't do better than that because the body you have is a body that breaks down and dies and is limited. Flesh and blood cannot have eternal life. But instead, we are promised that we will have eternal life. And we can only have eternal life when this body finishes and when we get dragged into eternity by Jesus. It's interesting to note, you say, well, Pastor Dave, what does it mean to say we will not all die, will we all be changed? Well, I've got bad news for you. 
unless God comes back or Jesus comes back between now and the next few years, we're all going to die. Yeah, every single person here. But what it means is simply this. Whether we're alive when Jesus comes back or we're not alive when Jesus comes back, death is what the, not the issue. Transformation is the issue. The body that we have that, that can never take us to eternity, that can never uh, live forever, has to be transformed into a body that will. And it is in that hope that we hold on and in which we live our lives. And then we see the final, and this is where it gets really important for you and I. Step number four. Our faith and the reality of what Jesus did for us, what overcoming death, must impact our everyday life. In verse 58, Paul says, So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord so that you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. How do we react? How do we react? We react, first of all, we need to be strong. We need to be strong. Now, what is that strength? That means that we turn our hearts and our lives to the Lord and we ask him to fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can do the things that he's called us to do. Our strength doesn't come from trying hard. Our strength doesn't come from exercise or energy. Our strength comes from the Holy Spirit who can extend and overcome through everything that we face up to. Not only do we need to be strong, but we need to be immovable. Now, the idea of being immovable is very important because being immovable talks about never giving up. I think that we all understand we face real challenges and real trials in this world. And the Word of God promises us that if we are faithful and never give up, He will bring us through everything. Now, now understand this, folks. God never asks us to do something that we cannot do. He never tells us, never make a mistake. Never create a sin. Never tell a lie. Never do this. Never do that. He doesn't want us to do those things. He wants us to transform those things, but he doesn't ask us to do what we can't do. He doesn't ask you to become a famous preacher or a famous evangelist. He doesn't ask you to become a world-class apologetics teacher. He asks you to be yourself, but he asks you to never give up, to be immovable, always standing for him. And then the third thing that we see here is that we need to work together. This is a reminder to you and I that we belong to the body of Christ. We are the church. We are going to, in a few minutes, we're going to take the Lord's table together. And when we eat the bread, we remind ourselves, just like there's one loaf, we are one body. And the things that we do can be done together and should be done together, including being strong and being immovable. We can be strong together. We can be immovable together. When I'm weak, you can lift me up. When you're weak, I can lift you up. You can encourage somebody when you know what's going on in their life. You can strengthen them when they no longer can be strong. And then number four, number four is a little bit of my own language. Number four just simply says this. Do the math. Do the math, folks. What you're being asked to do is to look at this life that you have, that if the very, very best you can stretch it out, you know, 80, 90, 100 years, And all the things in this life, many of which create misery and all those other kinds of things, and you're being offered an opportunity to live for eternity because of what Jesus did. And do the math. What makes more sense? To live your life for yourself and be miserable and and be empty at the end? Or to live your life for the King of kings and Lord of lords who died to set you free and live a life that goes through all eternity? Talk about return on investment. Man, oh man. Do the math, my brothers and my sisters. Bet with your lives and bet on God. One of the great philosophers of of, uh, early ages was a guy named Blaise Pascal. And he wrote some very influential things, uh, philosophical things, and even some of the areas of probability theory and things like that. And Pascal's wager is a very famous statement. You want to spend some time looking it up. But the important thing that Pascal said is, we bet, we all bet with our lives on whether there is a God or not. And if we bet wrong, it's a terrible thing. And if we bet right, we enjoy eternity. Make a decision to live your life for him, for everything that he has done for you. Not for this world. Not for a world that ends in death. But for him who has overcome death. And in his overcoming of death, he has defeated the fear of death 
And he offers you and I the opportunity to be with him forever.